Good afternoon, and thank you for joining the Mesa Verde Foundation. I'm Monica Buckle. I serve on the Foundation's Board of Directors, and I'll be moderating today's event. It's a real pleasure to officially inaugurate the Mesa Verde Foundation's monthly webinar series. Every second Wednesday of each month, Conversations from the Mesa will feature Mesa Verde National Park staff and their areas of expertise. Today, we are fortunate to have Stephen Mott joining us, a National Park Service archeologist. We will have an overview of Mesa Verde National Park and explore the preservation of Mesa Verde's ancestral Puebloan architecture and its stabilization. In 2018, the foundation contributed over $70,000 to the stabilization of Cliff Palace. Before I touch upon Stephen's background, for viewers who may not be familiar, the Mesa Verde Foundation is the official philanthropic nonprofit partner to Mesa Verde National Park. Mesa Verde National Park is one of the 12 original UNESCO World Heritage Sites and is the ancestral home of the Pueblo people. As a foundation, we secure funding for the park's capital improvements, special projects, and further promote understanding and preservation for ancestral Puebloan culture. Currently, the foundation is helping to fund the production and pre-production of a new interpretive film for the park's visitor center, which also includes helping to fund a native filmmaker perspective. Recently, the foundation helped fund the landmark repatriation of 20 ancestral Puebloan individuals and 28 funerary objects. Last year, the ancestral Puebloan individuals and objects were repatriated back to Mesa Verde. The foundation also provided funding for the ceremonial reburial. Please visit our website to view more about our current and past fundraising endeavors, events, and our upcoming three-day immersive fall tour at the park. All information can be found on our website as well as on our Instagram and Facebook. I'll be dropping those links in the chat box to follow. I would like to personally thank the park superintendent, Cliff Spencer, Mesa Verde's Foundation's Executive Director, Shannon Clifford, our social media manager, Emily Sweat, and of course, the Foundation's superb board of directors. Our public programming is possible solely from donations and the support of Mesa Verde Foundation fellows and members like you. We thank you for creating space for this webinar offering. Next month on April the 14th, we are delighted to have the park's chief of natural resources, Tova Spector. Tova will discuss the park's diverse wildflowers and rare plants. What a wonderful way to usher in spring. Now circling back to our guest speaker for today, Stephen Mott has been associated with Mesa Verde National Park for 14 years. He previously worked for the National Park Service at Aztec Ruins National Monument and Bandelier National Monument, both in New Mexico. His experience includes natural disaster response, emergency archeology, span burned area emergency response, and cultural resource damage assessment. Stephen graduated from Fort Lewis College with a Bachelor of Arts degree in anthropology and a certificate in cultural resource management. He served as a teacher's assistant at Fort Lewis, overseeing archeological excavations. Stephen has published numerous National Park Service condition and assessment reports and worked with the Department of Interior for cultural resource damage assessment. We'll be taking questions and comments at the end of the presentation and we won't be using the Q&A box, we'll solely be using the chat box. So please feel free to share those questions at the end. I would like, not, I would like to now welcome Stephen to the event. So Stephen, welcome.
And Stephen, you can unmute yourself. Thank you. I, yeah, forgot to unmute. Uh, I know, good afternoon, right? everyone. We all do. <laughs> all right, let me get my screen up here and. Yeah, please take your time. So I understand a snowstorm is heading your way at Mesa Verde. Um, yeah, you could say that. We actually kind of had the, the storm hit us uh, yesterday, um, but it will be sticking around the San Juan Mountains or the La Plata Mountains all weekend and hopefully uh, dump some snow on us. Great. So um, I'm just going to pass it over to you and just let you begin. We're in for such a treat. All right, thank you very much, Monica. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for taking the time to hear about how we have preserved the architecture at Mesa Verde National Park. I will be using terminology that I use every day working with the stabilization crew. If I reference something by saying Mesa Verde Stave, I am referring to the stabilization crew at the park. Archaeology is the scientific study of historic or prehistoric peoples and their cultures by an analysis of their artifacts, inscriptions, monuments, and other such remains. Uh, let's get started with stabilization archaeology at Mesa Verde. Over 100 years ago, the recognition of prehistoric peoples in and around Mesa Verde started to happen. Curious people chasing cattle, looking for water sources, or just exploring found massive communities tucked away in sandstone alcoves, not sure when the inhabitants of these community, communities left. These early explorers of Mesa Verde started to poke around and realize that an ancient culture created these monumental structures. Through word of mouth, photography, and newspapers reporting on these ancient communities uh, drew attention and interest from the emerging discipline of archaeology within academics. This mesa in southwest Colorado, lifted over a thousand feet from the Montezuma Valley floor, not only had two and three story architecture, but some seemingly suspended against cliffs. These structures came with artifacts large ceramic vessels, both corrugated and smooth finished, bowls with exquisite designs, symbols, animal and human depictions, beautiful turquoise and other polished stone and bone jewelry and ornaments. Yucca made sandals so tightly woven that the thought of these being made in a factory probably occurred. The interest in ancient cultures have, had arrived in North America. One didn't have to travel to Mexico, Central America, Europe, or Egypt to get their hand at possibly finding riches that could remain hidden in these buildings that were standing for who knows how long. Many attributed these dwellings with the Aztec culture of, of Mexico. Not far from Mesa Verde is now called Aztec Ruins National Monument. But 100 years ago, the pioneers of Aztec New Mexico labeled prehistoric standing architecture as remnants of the Aztecs. Yes, Spanish explorers who came through the Southwest, specifically the Dominguez Escalante expedition of 1776, recorded these ruins and noted that the Aztecs traveled far to set up outposts for their empire. However, as we know today, these weren't Aztec ruins. And as research over the next hundred years showed that these dwellings and ruins came from a culture so complex and organized that we can only wonder about their social interactions. Through ethnology, we have been able to piece together some of these ceremonies, celebrations, and reasons why certain architectural features existed, yet we won't ever know. Now, let me get back on track here. The Weatherall's John Lacey and Virginia McClurg, amongst others, caught the itch of wonderment of these past peoples yet were concerned about the treatment of the architecture and the looting of artifacts. Solicitation to, pro to protect this region through the Cliff Dwellers Association and women's clubs in Denver occurred. Please remember women's rights and their rights and their right to vote hadn't even occurred yet. So their influence should not be overlooked. 
With the help from Edgar Lee Hewitt, sometimes deemed one of the first American archaeologists, brought attention to Congress to protect these ancient sites. Finally, in 1906, the Antiquities Act was established and at the same time establishing Mesa Verde as a national park, the first national park to protect and preserve Native American culture. And to this day, is still the only national park that displays Aboriginal Native American architecture for the education of the public. Yes, we have many national monuments that have been created because of the Antiquities Act, but maybe in my lifetime, I will get to see another ancient Native American site move from monument status to national park status. After the creation of Mesa Verde into a park, much work had to be done, not only to bring visitors to the national park, but to excavate and stabilize these monumental structures in order for the public to be able to safely access this breathtaking architecture. Now let's get into it even more. Archaeologists have defined the region of the ancestral Pueblo culture to span everywhere that the San Juan River drainage encompasses, including all drainages, rivers that flow into the San Juan River. This area is from the Abajo Mountains and Cedar Mesa in Utah through the Montezuma Valley, Mesa Verde Plateau, and areas surrounding the Mancas, La Plata, Animas, Piedra, and Pine Rivers, all the way to the upper San Juan River Valley near Pagosa Springs, Colorado, where Chimney Rock National Monument is located, another site where Mesa Verde Stabe has influenced the preservation of the standing architecture. Mesa Verde prehistoric climate can be compared to the climate we have in the Mesa Verde, Mesa Verde region today. The summers were hot and dry and spanned from June through August. Winters can have extreme cold temperatures with varied amounts of snow or moisture falling during the winter months. Some years we can receive abundant amounts of snow, other years we will have very limited moisture. The fall time can vary from moderate nights to warm days with sporadic rainfall. The spring months are cold, below freezing at night and warm up to between 60 and 80 degrees days. Not to say that snow can't fall anytime until June. Droughts are not uncommon in the Southwest and droughts happen. There has been moisture snow as early as late July in the La Plata mountain range and extend into late May or early June. The growing season of frost-free days occurs usually from mid-May through September. Just as we are experiencing a drought today during prehistoric times, droughts occurred and most likely played into the movement of peoples throughout the Four Corner region. The environment of Mesa Verde spans from the high desert region to low mixed coniferous forests of Douglas fir, ponderosa pine, and blue spruce. The high desert region consists of sage plains with mixed pinyon juniper forests occurring throughout. There are deep canyons cutting through Mesa Verde with large mesas on top. The Mancus River flows on the eastern and southern edges of the park. Perennial springs and seeps within the alcoves created by the juncture of Cliff House sandstone with Menifee shale these springs provide a microclimate for ferns and mosses to grow. These could have helped draw Aboriginal inhabitants to this geologic uplift. The habitat within the park supports mammals, birds, reptiles, amphibians, fishes, and invertebrates. Like many national parks, and because of our protected status, allows visitors, visitors to experience plants and animals that may no longer exist outside of the protected park boundaries. One of these plants, the Cliff Palace Milk Veg, are endemic to Mesa Verde and found nowhere else. Even Dis can we, can I interrupt and can we go back to the previous slide, please? Yes. Now I see a bear on the top left photo. So do you wanna tell us where he is in the park? Oh uh, yeah, that, that, that bear is at Spring House. And, and actually all the, the, the four photos on this page are all taken at Springhouse, just different angles of uh, the archeological site where animals or the wildlife have accessed it just as uh, we do. Fabulous, thank you. All right, let me get back into it. 
All right, despite its name, Mesa Verde is actually more of a cuesta, a gradual slope that dips into one in one direction than a mesa, an isolated flat topped highland surrounded by steep slopes. The cuesta had been dissected over time by rivers and streams, creating a series of mesas and canyons. Four Cretaceous aged formations are exposed in Mesa Verde National Park. This period dates from 145 to 66 million years ago. From oldest to youngest, they are the Mancus Shale, Point Lookout Sandstone, Menifee Formation, and Cliff House Sandstone. The Mancus Shale colored dark gray to black was deep underwater during the Cretaceous period. The next is Point Lookout Sandstone and has interbedded layers of brown sandstone and gray fossil, fossil or, excuse me, fossil, fossil furnaces shale. I butchered that. This layer indicates a transition from deep water to shallow water. The next is the Menifee Formation, gray to gray orange cross bedded sandstone, which lies conformably above point lookout sandstone, meaning both stratigraphic layers are continuous in time. Last is Cliff House Sandstone. Named for the dwellings built using these rocks, Cliff House Sandstone is gray to orange yellow sandstone. These rocks are susceptible to chemical weathering from weak acids in percolating water. This is what formed the alcoves that gave space for the ancestral pueblo to build within, then leading to the exploration and creating of exhibit sites such as Cliff Palace, Balcony House, and Spruce Tree House. Native Americans or indigenous peoples have been calling Mesa Verde home for generations. Assuming that most everyone listen, listening today has visit, visited Mesa Verde, I will not be giving a comprehensive overview of the cultural occupations that define this unique geographic area. After visiting Mesa Verde, one can take away an understanding of the skills and organization needed to build their homes and villages within alcoves and on the mesa tops. A large amount of stone, wood, and mortar, which required copious amounts of water, were all procured and assembled without the use of the wheel, without metal tools for shaping stone and cutting wood, and with only baskets and vessels for collecting soil and water shows the determination of the people and that we as a collective world heritage can learn from the past to better the future of our cultures. Mesa Verde has it all and continued research and management of the cultural resources here and within the region will continue to rewrite dates of the occupation, giving back to the history of indigenous people throughout the Americas and the world. Stephen, what are we uh, looking at on this slide? Uh, so we're looking at, um, uh, two artifacts that were found during our uh, the, the unfortunate um, uh, 2020 Moorfield fire um, uh, that occurred last summer. Uh, these artifacts that are archaic in the time and uh, add to the archaic uh, occupation that occurred here at Mesa Verde. Uh, the projectile point on the left and the grinding slab on the right are two of uh, a few other artifacts and features that we found dating to the archaic. Great, thank you. All right. Well, the mission of the National Park Service. The National Park Service preserves unimpaired the natural and cultural resources and values of the national park system for the enjoyment education and inspiration of this and future generations. The Park Service cooperates with partners to extend the benefit of natural and cultural resource conservation and outdoor recreation throughout this country and the world. Along with the mission of the National Park Service comes the federal laws and regulations regulations we follow. These laws not only guide our work, but also remind us that the protection and care for these sites extends beyond the education and enjoyment of visitors by taking into account indigenous people's concerns and considerations towards the preservation of our collective world heritage. 
a heritage that we all need to remember is important to the future of our parks and culture. Sorry, I hope I didn't scare you. Uh, yes, the Stave Crew helps to preserve and protect natural resources too. This is a naturally mummified ringtail cat that we found inside the historic viewing deck at Cliff Palace. This ringtail cat may be one of two that were ever handled within the park. Derek Newsbaum, a uh, stepson of Jesse Newsbaum, one of the superintendents, is one of the uh, two people that have handled it. The other was myself. Um, and yeah, I believe I may have had lunch after, but, and I think I washed my hands after touching that, but not sure. Oh my gosh, I hope so, Stephen. <laughs> well, archaeologists are known for digging in dirt and, well, and that's we, true. we do stay pretty dirty during the field season. Uh, anyway, getting into the history of stabilization. Even though Gustav Nordenskjold was credited for conducting, conducting the first scientific ex excavations or investigations, uh, however, under the direction of Bureau of Ethnology, Fuchs was the first hired archaeologist. Fuchs instituted techniques using native materials in his repairs, controlling runoff above a cliff dwelling by diverting, diverting water, capping walls exposed to rain and snowmelt with Portland cement, and building shelters over a dirt walled pit house. He was also responsible for the interpretation of the sites, too for when visitors would have the chance to experience the ruins. He was also the first to start campfire talks amongst visitors to the park. Fuchs' stabilization philosophy is quoted, archeological experts may differ in the judgments regarding the extent of work necessary to repair a ruin as much mutilated as Spruce Treehouse. It is difficult to determine a strict line of demarcation between repair and restoration work. The author has sought to avoid any restoration which would involve him in any theoretical questions, even when he had good reasons to adopt an obvious interpretation. He has endeavored to preserve the picturesque character of the walls when possible and has not attempted to foist on the observer any theory of construction that was not clearly evident. End when quotes. When would you say that the image on the left before the stabilization, when do you estimate that to have been taken? Uh, that was uh, approximately the late 1880s, early 1890s. Mm -hmm. and, and then uh, the, with the one on the right uh, uh, was most likely taken during the, the teens, the 19 teens. Yeah. It, it's something because as much as I love learning about Mesa Verde, there are a few um, before stabilization photos. So I'm really enjoying this. Oh, thank you. Uh, all right, well, uh, Fuchs's philosophy was not that far off of what the Vanishing Treasures Program within the National Park Service is. No reconstruction unless absolutely necessary for the architectural exhibit. Do as minimal as possible to stabilize and steady architecture without changing any Aboriginal integrity of the wall that is being worked on. Uh, moving on from Fuchs, we uh, have uh, Jesse Newsbaum. Uh, here's a fun fact. The only reason Jesse Newsbaum became superintendent in 1921 is due to a personal call to Stephen T. Mather, director of the National Park Service at the time by Jesse Walter Fuchs complaining about how previous superintendent's son-in-law was removing artifacts from being from the cliff dwellings during his free time away from being a park ranger. Mather appointed Newsbaum to the superintendent, a position he held for 17 years. In 1926, Newsbaum excavated three modified basket maker pit houses in the south end of Step House. This was significant at the time, knowing the north end of Step House contains cliff dwellings that date to the Pueblo III time period showing multiple use periods for this alcove that are not continuous in occupation, but are separated by a few hundred years. And moving on to Al Lancaster. 
where to begin with Al Lancaster and his work that he accomplished at the park. I'll probably miss many examples of his work towards stabilization, but know that the reason most of these exhibit sites are still standing can be attributed to Lancaster's intensiveness to repairing Pueblo architecture over the 30 plus years he worked at Mesa Verde. Originally, Al was hired to be Earl Morris's assistant for the development of a ruined stabilization and repair program. This is when the PWA, Public Works Administration Project, um, came to light. This project uh, called Measuring and Preserving Cliff Dwellings and Pueblos uh, occurred and working alongside Lancaster, a, Qatar, a, excuse me, a cartographer, Stanley E. Morse, designed a project using different colored string to depict what was original masonry, stabilized reconstructed masonry, along with measuring scales to show the dimensions of walls and features, and other signboards depicting direction and other specific specifics for the unit of architecture they were photographing. Above our photos of the boulder located directly under Speaker Chief area at Cliff Palace. The right photo shows a white string outlining a poured concrete pier directly underneath to slow downward movement of the boulder. This was part of Morse's photograph coding of a stabilization method. The left photo shows Lancaster and crew constructing a wall to hide these concrete piers from visitors. During the 1940s and 50s, Mesa Verde and the park service had a plan to develop a roadside display where visitors would have a series of stops that interpreted the evolution of architecture of the ancestral Pueblo culture. This road had been developed to a certain extent with views of cliff dwellings and sun temple. However, the pit houses that was, that was originally excavated was in disarray due to not having a cover over it. This led to Lancaster needing another pit house for display. And with the help of Don Watson, the two went about locating the site to complete the exhibit. The, this site continued through the present to be called the Twin Trees site. This automobile inspired exhibit would be completed in 1950 after Lancaster excavated Sun Point Pueblo, Site 16 and a basket maker pit house. Lancaster was named the senior author for all three of these excavations. By 1951, protective roofs, paths and railings accompanied the ruins, the ruins road sites and would be ready for public visitation. The ruins road loop name changed and is now known as the Mesa Top Loop. Uh, this uh, slide here shows um, the tower at Cliff Palace. Uh, the left photo shows uh, three stories that were reconstructed by Fuchs. And Lancaster's concern for Fuchs's work, uh, and, and not just his work, but just some uh, uh, instability that was shown uh, resulted in Lancaster removing uh, that corner of the tower and rebuilding it to a four stories high. This slide shows now uh, some more of uh, Morse's uh, architectural coding with strings, however, as, as well as Lancaster's work. Uh, the left photo shows a uh, buttress wall that Fuchs had built to help hold this, the leaning architecture of Farview Great House. Uh, with documentation, and, and because of documentation, uh, Lancaster knew this or, or saw this and, and uh, actually deconstructed that buttress wall, removing it completely from the site. However, he did uh, reconstruct the lean out of that wall, uh, helping to stabilize that outer wall of Farview Great House. Lancaster was in charge of, of the Weatherall Mesa project that started in 1958. He was also tasked with designing the architectural exhibits for the Badger House community, Step House, and Long House. 
Another accomplishment was being in, in association with Robert H. Lister of the Uni University of Colorado and bringing university students to Mesa Verde for field schools uh, that gave the park extra labor to get these sites excavated. Uh, and that's a theme throughout the park history is having students come and help with some type of research or uh, work stabilization um, throughout. And you'll hear more about that soon. Uh, this crew shot of Al Ancaster in the cowboy hat with his crew show Navajo Masons. Navajo crew members for the stabilization program were invalu invaluable to our work. They were reliable and would want to come back every year and not leave for other jobs. A couple of these guys are in the next photo and worked on the crew for over 30 years, possibly uh, 40 plus years. Uh, now moving on to uh, Kathy Fierro. Uh, what can be said about Kathy Fierro? She supervised the stave crew for 16 years at the park. She was integral in continuing the stabilization traditions that Fuchs, Lancaster, and others instilled here at Mesa Verde. Her value towards innovation within stabilization allowed for many ingenious ways to preserve standing architecture, especially at Hovenweep, where she slowed the erosion of the sandstone boulder which the square tower sits ensuring the weight of the tower would not com compromise the eroding sandstone boulder. The research she put into projects resulted in new ways of stabilizing sites. Her use of roplex within pit house structures has yet to be a challenge for another type of amendment be added to pit house walls and keeping them stable. Her support of the Navajo crew and continuing a long tradition that Newsbump started with Navajo workers. I'm going to ask a question, Stephen, if we can go back to the previous slide. Um, great, thank yes. you. This is one, this is a question from one of our fellows. Um, in the bottom photo, uh, there's a person holding a syringe. What is being injected? Uh, so that's a, uh, it's a, uh, a mixture of uh, preservation materials. It's actually a, a mixture of uh, uh, gelatin. Uh, heated up um, so it's liquid gelatin that uh, helps to adhere the plaster the earthen plaster to the sandstone masonry thank you uh, and i'll actually add that too this is a uh, that was done by um, the university of pennsylvania's uh, conservation program uh, which uh, frank matero uh, led for a number of years and and many um future park service and other uh uh workers uh were trained through and actually uh a couple of my uh supervisors at uh, bandolier were students of his as all as well all right all right techniques of our of architectural stabilization ever since the preservation of architecture at mesa verde with fuchs we have always strived to do what is best for the exhibits or archaeological sites the visitors witness. This has brought changes both in personnel over the years and how we stabilize these structures. We no longer use Portland cement as a mortar for the architecture. We now use earthen mortar mixed with sand, a sand clay loam mined from within the park. Sometimes we will amend our mortars with cement or in the past we used acrylic polymers such as Roplex. Other monuments use what is known as Duraweld. It is required to match the Aboriginal mortar with modern mortar requiring us to dye or add colorant to the mortar. However, we do still use Portland cement to cap the top of walls that receive rain and snow that are exposed to weather events on the Mesa tops. Uh, moving on, um, and actually the last slide showed uh, what was a, uh, a crack monitor and, and crack monitors are used to uh, measure how much a wall moves or potentially will move um, over time. It also gives us a warning that if a, uh, if a crack monitor uh, has moved in, in any amount that we know that 
uh, there's some type of movement going on and that uh, a potential collapse of architecture could occur. Uh, the photo of me here uh, is actually right after I graduated college working on uh, what is called Corn Cob House. And this is a, a backcountry house that um, has received uh, many treatments of stabilization. And I'm actually installing a silicone drip line, which allows water or actually say I want I don't want to say it allows it causes water when rain or snow rolls over the, the cliff rim um, and hits the silicone the water will bead straight down instead of going into the site causing uh, erosional issues to the architecture So our current stabilization practices occur to front, front country sites and back country sites. Uh, we predominantly uh, work on front country sites right now. Uh, however, we do and will get to back country sites to, to check on their condition uh, since stabilization has occurred. Uh, front country stabilization at Square Tower House. Uh, during the winter of 2007, a rock fall fell and hit a wall of Akiva, resulting in the stabilization of the architecture. Um, on uh, the right, you will see uh, two of our stabilization crew members pondering what to do with the large slab of sandstone that had fallen down and knocked out that wall. Um, with uh, a lot of thought, and determination, we have uh, figured out how to stabilize this site. Um, here are uh, more examples of the actual stabilization going on. Um, the left photo shows uh, mortar lay uh, stones reset in a, a new bed of mortar. And then that also shows where they had to support the vent shaft tunnel uh, using um, uh, blocks of wood to then complete all the stabilization. Um, multiple steps of resetting, replacing, repointing, and uh, a lot of time because we have to wait uh, a day to two days to uh, then go back and work on that uh, for the mortar to set, uh, ensuring that uh, no movement or or uh, other issues that we cause could happen. Uh, this is uh, more photos of the stabiliz stabilization work and a photo on the right shows uh, the completed uh, work around the Kiva. Um, during the square, uh, the square tower stabilization project or emergency stabilization project, uh, there is a result that actually resulted in uh, the stabilization crew uh, realizing that uh, more additional work had to occur. And uh, that work had to occur to the square tower portion of the square tower house. And here you'll see uh, the beginning stages of a uh, tube and clamp scaffolding that we set up that was on the exterior of the square tower, went into a partial uh, originally roofed kiva, as well as on the inside of the tower. Um, here shows one of our uh, crew members, uh, the crew lead Gary Etheridge, um, working on uh, one of the walls. Um, on the right shows a scaled rendering of the wall showing all masonry features, conditions, and now stabilization repairs to the architecture. Uh, this architectural documentation is a product to later utilize to show preservation episodes in conjunction with our stabilization documentation form we complete. Uh, an example of a form will be shown here in a bit. Uh, here's the photo of the completed tube and clamp scaffold going all the way up to the fourth story of the tower, uh, along with a, uh, one of our other crew members um, stuffing mud in between a wall and 
a uh, boulder that had fallen um, prior to the uh, the building of Square Tower by ancestral Pueblo inhabitants. Here are a couple more photos of our crew members uh, pointing, as well as doing uh, doing documentation for the Square Tower project. Moving on to Sun Temple. Um, Sun Temple is a Mesa top site. And in 2019, we completed a comprehensive stabilization project over the whole site, uh, repointing and uh, resetting stones. The photo on the right shows volunteers. Um, we utilize a lot of volunteers. We uh, call this uh, group of uh, uh, volunteers the Dream Team. They've come back multiple years to give their time um, towards uh, stabilization. They uh, do it without any pay and uh, just love to work on the, on the architecture, uh, helping to preserve it. Uh, here are a few more photos of the Sun Temple work. But along with uh, stabilization here at the park and uh, the many uh, hats I wear um, causes um, me to leave sometimes. Sometimes I'll be uh, here at Sun Temple cutting down a stump out of the Pueblo, but then the next day I could be on a wildland fire uh, directing a dozer punching line. And actually that occurred in 2019. Uh, at Sun Temple, I uh, was called to respond to the Decker fire outside of Salida, Colorado. Um, and after I got on the fire, on the left shows a, uh, a historic cabin, uh, a tongue and groove, or excuse me, a uh, dovetailed uh, wooden cabin that was uh, actually unrecorded. And uh, we had it recorded for uh, with the BLM as well as uh, uh, smoke showing from that fire. And as soon as I was on the fire, I was, and then as soon as I was off the fire, I was back to STABE because STABE work never goes away. <laughs> Our job is uh, continuous through the field season and continuous through the winter doing tons of documentation. I have um, just gonna insert a question for you how much pre-planning um, goes into the initial preparations before you start a stabilization project? So how far out in advance do you have to plan? Um, sometimes we plan with, uh, uh, initially we submit projects uh, through the park service um, three to five years in advance and as we close in on that date to work on a project, uh, we'll usually spend parts of the winter leading up to that project uh, um, working to put together previous documentation, historic documentation, um, background research, showing all the walls and the, and the uh, stabilization that had occurred in the past. And, and you, we usually will try to create a, a large binder for that work so that we can bring it out onto the site when we start the field work during the field season. All right. So outside of Mesa Verde, um, the STABE crew has uh, continued to work for other agencies. Mesa Verde Stabilization has always been an outlet to other national monuments to ensure their standing architecture is preserved and stabilized. Hovenweep, Aztec ruins are prime examples of this where archeologists from Mesa Verde traveled to these monuments and guided stabilization projects. Just as in the past, Mesa Verde Stabilization is continually sought for our expertise in ruin stabilization. During 2011, the STABE crew was contracted with Glen Canyon in helping to stabilize Defiance House. Then again in 2019, we went back to Defiance House for another condition assessment for potential work in the future. Uh, this slide here shows Chimney Rock. Uh, this is actually my first project ever with the stabilization crew when I was an intern with uh, Mesa Verde National Park through Fort Lewis College. Um, this shows uh, 
our front side of our form that we, we fill out. And, uh, and yeah, this is a, was quite an experience to uh, get to work on Chimney Rock uh, first before heading back to Mesa Verde to do stabilization there. Um, we uh, will document uh, everything from start to finish. Um, and I'm gonna go back here, uh, recording how many stones we reconstruct or reset or uh, put into the cap, as well as uh, the mortar we use and, and how much coverage we have done for the stabilization of that, um, that wall or that feature. Um, And then continuing on, um, the first photo you saw was a crew shot of Lowry Ruin National Monument with the covered roof. Um, the the Stave crew continues to have a partnership with Canyons of the Ancients uh, National Monuments uh, with the Bureau, Bureau of Land Management. Um, just completing work at Lowry Ruin this past fall, completing stabilization of the Great Kiva, numerous rooms, and stabilization of the lower banquette wall of Kiva B. At this same time, the Stave crew worked alongside the Ancestral Lands crew out of a conservation legacy, a youth and young adult nonprofit volunteer organization. Um, here you see the, our, our crew lead, Gary Etheridge, um, advising the Ancestral Lands crew uh, with the stabilization within the Great Kiva. And then the right photo is of uh, Heath Martin, uh, one of our member crew members, uh, helping stabilize Kiva B recess. Uh, the Kiva B lower banquette, banquette wall uh, had never received stabilization prior to, at least masonry stabilization, prior to uh, this uh, project in uh, this last fall. Um, I, I did the stabilization of this uh, lower banquette and uh, to be honest, it did cause me anxiety before I got into it um, just because how was I going to get stones to fit into the spots where needed, the voids, as well as trying to replicate the prehistoric architecture uh, that is present. Um, as soon as I got into it, that those feelings left and, and I was in my element and, uh, the end result, uh, kind of looked, it looked like this, and this is part of our documentation as well for when we report, uh, back to the BLM on the work we completed. Uh, this shows all the, the, the red lines show all the new material we added and, um, and then the green, the extent of the repair work, um, I didn't count how many chinking stones I added to this area. I had to estimate because there was that many to try to uh, replicate the architecture of the surround within the surrounding Kiva. And uh, yeah, I would definitely put chinking stone at over three to 500 uh, in that little section of, of wall. Um, also, what the stabilization crew does uh, just recently is helping with uh, bear work um, at the park. And bear work is burn area emergency response. Uh, these photos show us cutting down a dead snag that was um, hanging over standing architecture in the newest alcove site uh, recorded at Mesa Verde. Uh, this was part of the Moccasin Mesa fire during 2018. And the next photo shows uh, a, another site where we would actually use what are called, it's a, called a V-grade stabilizer. So we went in, cut down all the dead snags off the archeological site or excuse me, archeological site. Uh, and, and then actually utilized those logs that we cut um, to put a V shape above and to the sides of the site to push water away from the architectural deposits that are buried, um, preserving the architect or the archaeological site uh, for the future. Um, we cut down these 
uh, burn snags for a, a specific reason, just to help preserve the in-ground deposits. If we were to leave these standing dead snags, they could be blown over in a windstorm, uh, uprooting the, the root ball, which would actually pull artifacts and other cultural um, items, possibly burials as well. And we want to prevent that as much as possible. Other areas that the stabilization crew uh, does within the park and is concerned with is rock hazard abatement. In addition to site preservation activities generally associated with stabilization, the crew has taken an active approach to assess and remediate hazards from falling rock within the alcove sites with the immediate goals of assessing a potentially dangerous situation and returning the site to a safe condition for park visitors and, and staff. Um, here's uh, a bunch of work that occurred after the winter of 2018, which was an epic year of snow. And uh, we determined that the boulder, right, here, if you see my cursor, um, had uh, uh, moved or expanded through a, say, freeze-thaw um, cycles and causing cracks in the rock to, uh, to alarm us. And uh, through an extensive project with uh, park partners from other national monuments, we, they helped us uh, remove that stone uh, through pins and feathers and, and knocking that stone off and resulting in a cleaned out chute uh, that is now safe for visitors to uh, enter Cliff Palace and, and not worry about rock hazards above. Um, now, this is, yes. Is that to you in the, the like the, between the two um, ledges or boulders? It is. It is. I'm I'm stuffed into that crack, and that just kind of <laughs> follows my my um, one of my roles with the stabilization crew. Even though I I, I am tall, I'm six four. Um, I do volunteer to go into some of the smallest spaces, tightest spaces there are, um, figuring out how to get my body into them, but then uh, more so just to complete the work to stabilize this ancestral pueblo architecture. Well, that's dedication. Oh, thank you. Oh, sorry. And then here's a here's a, just a series of photos where uh, my uh, climbing partner Chris Schneider was knocking off a slab uh, that was right next to that chute. Uh, right now, I'm going to show you a video of a of another um, rock hazard at Step House. I'll play it for you uh, two more times. And then one more for entertainment. All right, so here we're, yeah, we're knocking off a, uh, a loose boulder. Uh, beneath that boulder was actually about a half inch to inch layer of sediments. So it was just waiting for a, uh, a deluge or a very intense rainstorm to uh, flood over the cliff, causing it to uh, loosen or move and, and then slide off. So we prevented that um, from happening. Um, and as you saw with the, the rock as it fell, that it was uh, very eroded or, or hydrated and, uh, and just on contact with the cliff uh, exploded. And instead of uh, that happening to our tourists, uh, it just happened in a secure and safe manner where no tourists or anybody was in the site. Well, with the Mesa Verde Foundation's past and continued support, the stabilization crew will continue to main, maintain the original standing Pueblo masonry that is the essence of our park. This preservation preserves the legacy of the ancestral Pueblo people 
for their descendants and will enable the public to be educated about and enjoy these sites for generations to come. Thank you to you all for letting me present on what it takes to preserve the architect architecture of Mesa Verde National Park. Thank you. Well, questions? Thank sure, thank you, Stephen. I'm gonna just circle back to, um, oh, that's a, before I say anything, who's in your arms? Uh, so that's my daughter, Maya Ann. She's uh, 15 months old um, and is, uh, my main interest and main um, purpose in life now. Oh, well, isn't that sweet? Thank you for sharing that photo. I adore it. Um, <laughs> we're gonna circle back quickly before we take other questions um, from one of our fellows. And uh, he had mentioned about uh, the injection um, into the pictograph or petroglyph. He wanted to know, is the chemical solution um, to help maintain the image quality? Uh, it's, it's not to maintain the image quality, but more so to uh, adhere the plaster back onto the, the sandstone masonry. Um, uh, an issue here at, at Mesa Verde and as well as other parks throughout the Southwest is that uh, this, this plaster, earthen plaster is so fine, finely made finally particles of, of, uh, of clay that um, throughout over time, it'll start to peel off away from the sandstone masonry. And so we try to do our best to, to keep those images because uh, those intact images are very rare to find at Mesa Verde and, and other parks. And if we can keep that on the, on the wall uh, for future researchers, and uh, viewing uh, the better for the preservation of that design and the preservation of the site. Thank you. So uh, now I'm gonna open it up to if we have any further questions. Um, oh, great, wonderful. This is from uh, Johnny. Have you had any success with soft capping treatments? I'm not familiar with that, so I'll let you just right. take it away. <laughs> um, we, we have exper experimented with soft capping techniques. Um, and uh, however, we uh, unfortunately, it, it didn't work. Um, and that's just due to the uh, large amounts of, uh, of weather or moisture we receive here in the, in the wintertime. Uh, a soft capping technique uh, actually was uh, designed by one of the... Uh, um, I believe uh, masters and or PhD candidates at uh, University of Pennsylvania. And they had first tried this technique in uh, the country of Turkey um, and uh, had brought it back to Mesa Verde because of uh, the similar uh, geography uh, and environment. However, uh, the, the one factor that we have at Mesa Verde compared to Turkey is uh, just the uh, extreme fluctuations in temperature and um, moisture events that we receive here in the winter time, where that soft cap could be under feet of snow for three to four months of the year, um, allowing moisture then to just penetrate through the freeze thaw cycle um, that occurs daily here at Mesa Verde. Thank you. We have a question from Rob. How do you cut the stones for such detailed stabilization? And second part to the question, do you use a radial arm saw? Um, no, we do not use a radial arm saw. Uh, we have uh, used um, some large uh, rock saws in the past just to uh, um, help shape brand new stone. However, um, we really try to reuse as much stone as possible and or try to find stone uh, outside of the site boundary and uh, within uh, the slopes to then um, do some uh, simple shaping just with hammers and chisels. 
Thank you. Uh, I wonder if that answers Rob's question. Yes, <laughs> you have a thank you from Rob. And um, I would just like to say, if we don't have any further questions or comments for Stephen or any questions or comments about the park in particular, then we'll just uh, wrap things up. So I'm just going to give the chat box uh, 10 more seconds. And then um, after that time, we'll kind of finish and come to a close. Yes, uh, this is for Lisa. There will be a recording of this event on our website. And not only that, but everyone who registered for this webinar and who's participating today will receive an email with a link to this recording. So it'll be on the website and you'll also be receiving a link shortly, perhaps tomorrow. Oh yes, we have a question for you, uh, Stephen. This is from Bob. Uh, this pertains to Spruce Treehouse and the status with the crack above it. So as of now, um, Spruce Treehouse is still closed to uh, the public and all personnel. And uh, we actually had to put uh, uh, push back the project for stabilizing that arch just due to the pandemic uh, and, and, and the, uh, the, the time frame for that. Um, uh, as, as everywhere, the pandemic affected all of our jobs um, and kept us out of the sites and kept visitors out of the sites. However, um, it did allow us to conduct um, a plethora of work at Cliff Palace, Site 16, and Balcony House instead. Um, but uh, there is still plans to stabilize the arch above spruce tree house however i can't uh give you a date wonderful and i have uh, a question from a colleague of mine in the native art world from dr saul she would like to know stephen are there any surprises you have learned over the years about the architectural techniques indigenous people used um that's a good question. Uh, I would just say just the just the way that they um, they built the the architecture uh, and and the what was left from them, um, actual fingerprints within the mortar, uh, the use of corn cobs to impress into the mortar instead of chinking stone, um, is just fascinating to see and, and to uh to work on a um a site or an, a, a cliff dwelling um there's always new things to be learned or new things to be observed um at uh when i was at my previous job at aztec ruins at west ruin um there were even though i had worked there for five to seven years some uh, uh closing in on my my uh end there i would recognize or or see features in the wall that i had never even seen over those last seven years so um just the uh complex complexity of the architecture of ancestral puebloans um is a continued uh research question and um uh, uh research potential for us to observe daily and hopefully see uh, new features, but also potentially new, new, new ways of preserving it. Mm -hmm. Hope that um, answered the question. I, I believe so, thank you. Uh, this pertains to the question that was asked about Spruce Tree House and the crack above. Um, this is a follow-up to what you had said. What is the plan? Is there a technique? Um, so uh, historically, um, they actually they they pinned the arch to the bedrock um, behind the arch, and uh, that's uh, what uh, 
uh, and, and that's one of the ideas to do that uh, in the future is to uh, repin the arch to the bedrock. Great, thank you. And um, it looks like we're gonna conclude this webinar. I would just like to thank all of you viewers for tuning in and supporting our very first event. And we hope to see you next month. That's April the 14th. And a special thank you to Stephen for taking the time to prepare such an informative presentation, script, slides. He also worked with fellow colleagues within the park and also at Aztec Ruins in Bandelier to prepare this presentation. So a special thank you to you, Stephen. And uh, I just wish everyone a good evening and be safe. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. It was my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you. thank you, Shannon. Uh, take care. And thank you, Monica. Uh, of course, Stephen. It was great. Thank you. Nice getting to know you. You too. Hopefully, I can uh, do a presentation on something completely different in the future. We welcome that. We will look forward to that. All right. Cool. Take care and have a good weekend and enjoy the snow, Shannon. Thank you. <laughs> You too. All right. Bye. Bye. Shannon, is it just us? Oh. Um, Stephen, um, I think if you choose to leave, it'll leave for all of us. It'll oh, do you want to stop everyone. recording? All right. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'm going to end it for all of us. So. <laughs>